Shana Tova, everybody. You're back with the Mench Warmers. Uh, Gabe and Jamie here talking about all things Jews and sports. It's uh, Monday, October 7th. Rosh Hashanah was last week. We're in the uh, the period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The 10 days of repentance. Uh, and so we should be making some apologies. Gabe, do you have any apologies to make this this time around? Um, I don't know if there's any acute, just sort of a general for who I am type thing for yeah. anyone I've affected. Just apologizing by, for who you are to by the world. my general being, I, I give apologies to that, um, to you. Uh, Jamie, I know, uh, do you have any? Well... Ones? I got a I got a minor one, and uh, it's a good segue to introducing the show today. A we have uh, our our weekly shlichut. Yeah, we have a big episode to kick off fifty seven eight fifty eighty six. Sorry, we we have a big episode to kick off fifty eight seventy. A fifty seven eighty, but close enough. Wait, which one is it? It's fifty seven eighty. I've been writing fifty seven seventy nine on my checks for the last couple <laughs> weeks. <laughs> Okay, we let's take it from the top. We got a yeah. big episode today for fifty-seven eighty. Could you imagine a bank that only deals in the Jewish calendar? <laughs> That's like, what Israeli bonds are. <laughs> yeah, like you have you have to cash this check by Tishrei seventeen, or so, it will become stale dated. Sometimes you get caught caught up in a in a leap alul. And, yeah, and, and, you, and you get screwed. And you get screwed. Uh, yeah, if your check is post dated to Adar two, yeah, you exactly. have to wait for three years in order to cash it. Uh, well, we have a big show for the first one of the Jewish New Year. Uh, we have, Gabe, our first interview with a professional athlete. Yeah, it's uh, very exciting. I know, uh, with all due respect to Jonathan Mayo, his professional athlete adjacency doesn't quite count. Right. We've had some, we've had some great interviews with uh, historians of sports, uh, with people who've been involved in, in, in media and things like that in sports. But this is our first one with a professional athlete. We have an interview coming up with Nate Thompson. A uh, Montreal Canadian, uh, a member of the Canadian... Uh, hockey and the Canadian Jewish community. Yeah. Uh, the well, Montreal Jewish community, similar to some of our listeners and readers of the CJN. That's right. And we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of our episode. Uh, but we really hope you stick around for that. Nate, Nate was kind enough to join us while he was in Toronto last week uh, playing the Toronto Maple Leafs, obviously. Uh, how did that game go? I saw, the, I saw the Leafs were up 4-1. They must have won, right? I didn't see the end. Okay. We'll leave it there. Uh, Nate was, again, kind enough to join us. Very, very nice of him. Uh, I, I will say, so I will say my slicha, uh, as it were, for uh, making the mistake that uh, I did not realize that Zach Hyman, our local Jewish uh, Toronto Maple Leaf, is no is not playing currently. He's injured. Uh, and I made a comment about Nate going up against him in the game on Saturday, but of course I didn't because Zach is injured. So my bad. Uh, as some of you may know, and uh, some of you will come to know, I'm not a big hockey fan. Well, uh, Jamie, you know, they didn't get to say Shana Tova to each other, uh, as Jamie suggests in the interview. But it sounds like Nate had a really wonderful new year, and we're excited to get to that interview. But first, we have a word from uh, the Canadian Jewish News Prize. As you know, the CJN Prize, some of our uh, favorite uh, sponsors we've had on the show before. Uh, their event is coming up October to their 30th, 2019. Jamie, what time do you th- of night or day do you think is the perfect time for an awards show reception to start? Ooh, I'm going to guess 7.30? 7.30 is the time the award ceremony starts, but you shouldn't get there at 7.30 if you're planning on going. You should go at 6.30 for the reception where a kashrut observed dessert, dessert will be served. Oh, that's great. Where do you believe a Jewish award ceremony and dessert should take place? I don't know. The uh, Bruma Pell Theater? <laughs> Very close. It's the Tribute Communities Recital Hall at York University Kill Street Campus in the Accolade East Building on the main floor. All right. The event will be keynote spoken by Professor Julia Creed of York University, a leading international scholar in cultural memory studies. It is a free event, and you must register by October 25th at bit.ly slash cjnpac19. Well, we'll see you guys there. Um... So let's uh, get into the episode, Gabe. It's it's a hockey night in uh, in all of Canada now. Knock knock. Who's there? Yitzhak. Yitzhak who? Yitzhaki night in Canada. There you go. Uh, there's some Jewish members of the NHL right now. Yep. Um, and to talk about some of them, I think we should play a little game real quick. Me and Jamie. I'm going to name some hockey players, and you're going to tell me. Which ones are Jewish? Okay. That's okay, based sure. on their names. Sure. little Jew or not Jew with little, hockey players. A little quick Jew or not Jew right here. Sure. We've got Henrik Zetterberg. Okay. Jakob Silverberg. Okay. And Jordan Schmaltz. Ooh. Um, I think it's not... 
Is it the second one? Not Henrik Zetterberg. Jakob Silverberg? Jakob Silverberg? The answer is none of them. Oh, we no. We have a lot of uh, Mike Jacobs all-stars in uh, Jewish hockey and some the opposite of that. As we go back to the first Jewish player to ever raise the Stanley Cup, uh, born in Weyburn Northwest Territories, won for the Victoria Cougars wow. in 1925, a man by the name of Gizzy Hart. Wow, that's pretty Jewish sounding. Gizzy? Gizzy, yeah. What do you think it was for? Like, like I don't know. It was probably like Gerhard Ger- or yeah. Gerald or something weird. I mean, that sounds pretty old world, uh, but you know. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of uh, non-Jewish Jewish sounding names in hockey, especially because there's a lot of like guys from North Dakota and Minnesota and something yeah. like that, where there's a lot of like German and Norwegian You, you have your, you know, Jordan Schmaltz, Jaden Schwartz, your Saskatchewan and Minnesota Germans turn prairie folk yeah they're real corn fed one way or another um and then you've got your swedes right like your Jakob silverbergs um and so on and so forth yeah and they all have a sort of ashkenazi bent to them which you know should take us to, which ironically uh this is someone i do know is jewish which is jack hughes who is the number one pick in the nhl this year that's right as uh, well as his brother quinn who and- is also a rookie this season uh, and number a high pick last year. Shout out to our, our uh, listener, Elon uh, Mann, who pointed out that Jack Hughes sounds like the name of Emil Zola's famous uh, essay exonerating uh, Captain Dreyfus. Wow. Jacques, Jacques Hughes. That's a very, very good point from our very kind listener. So, so uh, it does have a sort of Jewish bent to it, but not a Jewish sounding name. I mean, it sounds Irish or something like that. Um, but yeah, Jack, I think, had his debut I saw earlier this week. I he mean, did? He, 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 he's a rookie, but he's he's coming up. That seems to be the way they do it these days for the high picks. That's right. He's a first overall pick, which means he's uh, probably likely to... Uh, you know, where he was likely started the team, started the season with the team as first overall picks do. He is, after two games, does not have a single point and is a minus three. Okay. But we it's trust early. he'll be there. What, what team is he on? Jack He's on Hughes. the New Jersey Devils. Oh, well, that's a good team, which I assume has a large Jewish fan base. I think so, too. Also, Jews don't really have that concept of hell. So the New Jersey Devils are just sort of a, ma- a cute mascot for us. Right. Yeah. I, I, are there uh, like religious Christians who won't follow the New Jersey Devils because of the team name? I would assume so. But the Jersey Devil is like some sort of like Chupacabra type thing. I right? think so. It's like a mythical it's a, beast. I thought it's a river rat type thing. I, but I don't think it's real. It's not like a Tasmanian Devil. Is a Tasmanian Devil real? Yeah. Do they really spin really, really fast? And, no, and that, that part's fake. That part's fake, okay. But uh, they're a real thing. They're like a, like a wombat kind oh, of thing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Is it like, but they're from Tasmania. They're from Tasmania. Right. Yeah. Okay. Nowhere, nowhere near New Jersey and probably somewhere where they don't play a ton of hockey either. Yeah, that's well, well good to know. Um, though if we're talking about the New Jersey Devils, uh, there's, you, know, you can think of David Putty going, The Devils! The Devils, yeah. And uh, scaring that poor Spanish priest yeah. after death. El Diablo, El Diablo, El Diablo. So any other big Jews we should know about in the NHL right um, now? The Hughes brothers are very, very big. There's a few. Um, there's a young, talented defenseman by the name of Jacob Chitrin okay. who uh, plays for the Phoenix Coyotes. Um, and there was the guy who was the high draft pick a couple years ago, right? The uh, he was, He's on Chicago. Uh, he's like, uh, he, he's like a mixed black Korean Jew. Oh, uh, it's Joshua Hosang. Joshua Hosang. Uh, right. he plays for New York. He okay. unfortunately didn't make the team again this season, oh, that's but too bad. he might get called up soon. He didn't make it out of camp. Um, I thought is, he was like a big prospect. He, he is. He's a big prospect. He is part Chilean, okay. part Chinese and part Jewish. Okay. So um, I had some of the components, right? You would say exactly. You had some of the components, right? He's not one of the common, uh, Jewish players you've heard of, uh, currently in the league. Um, there's a couple of young prospects coming up. High draft pick Adam Fox, who'll be playing very, very soon, um, as well as you know some other Jews we know who are in the league right now. Uh, David Warshawski and Jason Zucker are two that come to mind, um, and they tend to be more American than Canadian, which I think is an interesting uh, thing yeah. for the minds of the Canadian Jewish news to talk about. But uh, something that is not uh, uh, so uh, something I've noticed. Yeah, and also Zach Hyman, of course, who we talked about briefly before. That's uh, right. Who's currently, what's he out with? What's his injury? Uh, he tore his ACL, I believe. Oh, that sucks. You know, I was at a wedding this summer. Sure. And Mr. Hyman was indeed in attendance. Wow. Uh, he did not dance the horror. That's too bad. And I was very disappointed until I found out it's because he had a torn ACL. Well, you missed our opportunity to have him on the podcast, but maybe someday soon. We got our first athlete Just now, so hopefully another one card. soon. Um, 
moving on from hockey, which I'm sure we'll have more to talk about. You know, it seems like there's some guys who are on the rise uh, who I'm sure we'll be checking in with as they progress. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Jack Hughes, any, if you're listening, anytime you want to talk about your bar mitzvah, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I uh, know, it was only five years ago. Wow, is he only 18? He's 18. That's amazing. It's amazing. I'm happy to chat. Uh, I'd love to chat. We, we would love to chat with you, Mr. Hughes, about your bar mitzvah. So moving on, unfortunately, we have a, a farewell to say. Uh, a little topical is our interview with uh, Nate Thompson. Nate talks about uh, how he converted to Judaism, one of the sort of rare athletes who converted to Judaism uh, during their playing career. And we want to say a fond farewell to Bob Tufts, a former Major League Baseball pitcher, who was also one of the few uh, MLB players to convert during his time. Uh, during his time playing, he, you know, had a short career in Major League Baseball. He was only there for three years, but afterwards went on to get his MBA from Columbia, went on to become a professor at Yeshiva University, which I think is pretty wow. pretty Jewish as far as it goes. Yeah. Uh, he was was diagnosed with cancer a few years ago and, and became a real advocate for patients, uh, started a blog in that regard, and taught sports management at Yeshiva, you know, really connected to the sports world. So uh, sad sad to see him go. Unfortunately, he was, he was quite young. He was only 63. Um, uh, never. But you know he he left a great legacy, and uh, you know our thoughts thoughts and prayers with his family. Uh, and you know feel for, we we've linked to some of the stories on our Twitter page. Feel free to check those out because he he led an interesting life and and was sort of you know a, an interesting intellectual sports person. Rest in peace to Bob Tufts as we look to our somber holiday. But I'll tell you what's not somber. What's not the somber? high holidays? Well, some of them are, some of them aren't. So we thought uh, we would have a little chat. Um, is in sort of inspired by a tweet I saw the other day explaining the holidays to, to non-Jews. You know, chat sort of the way we do on this podcast. That's what we do. Uh, so it was just Rosh Hashanah last week. Uh, gave the you, head of the year. The head of the year. You had a break. Sorry, you had a Rosh Hashanah dinner. You had a few. I did. We, uh, I went to my mother's both nights, saw family, my little nephew, some cousins, some uncles. It was beautiful. And Rosh Hashanah, very joyous, you know, New Year, all that. Uh, Yom Kippur, a little more somber. The That's Day of right. Atonement, the most holy day in the Jewish calendar. Uh, and so what we wanted to talk about is what holiday do you think is most likely to break out into the mainstream and capture the minds of Jews and non-Jews alike? So, you know, for example, there's some holidays that are sort of secular that have, uh, you know, just become sort of mainstream holidays. Sort of like if the Jews were to ever have a Christmas, like yeah, exactly. capital C Christmas. But like you think of like St. Patrick's Day or Chinese right. New Year, uh, things like that that have... Because, you know, caught onto the mainstream one way or another. Even like a, a festival like like uh, Holy, the the Indian festival, right. where people sort of run and paint themselves in a way that's you know been criticized for its lack of respect for the, for the sanctity of the holiday. Do you think but... we could start like a five k run where someone has to hold a full menorah with one candle in each little thing and carry it each way uh, 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 without little... without dropping any of the candles? Sort of like an Olympic uh, torch relay, but yeah. but for Hanukkah, but like like they do with the color runs for Holy. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, so we're talking about which which Jewish holiday has the best chance to go mainstream. I mean, Rosh Hashanah has a chance. You know, it's a new year. Uh, fall is like, certainly needing another holiday. You know, like the Chinese New Year, their calendar gets a holiday. So you're suggesting maybe our calendar could could get someone too. And then, you know, I think Yom Kippur is out. Uh, the other high holidays probably, there's too much going on around them. I think Hanukkah is a, a big one, you know, because Hanukkah is always sort of mirrored Christmas. But yep. I think Christmas's presence as the the winter, you know, the sort of er winter holiday. It, it overshadows Hanukkah. And I think there's a lot of, you know, cross-brand uh, celebration, uh, to lack of a better term. You know, you see a lot of Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. You know, the mayor will come to you, the, the local menorah sure. lightings and such. And ultimately, you know, we've incorporated a lot of the elements of sort of Western Christmas into Jewish Hanukkah at this point, gift giving and yep. uh, lighting up things and all kinds of stuff. Some sort of Hanukkah bush and popcorn on a string and you know, yeah. waiting for Jesus to come down the chimney. So the other big Jewish holiday, of course, Passover. Yep. Unfortunately, paired with another uh, Christian holiday, which is Easter, usually happen almost exactly at the same time. So there are some people, you know, who are so Christian, they're Jewish. Sure. Because, like, I think, like, some evangelicals have a Seder. Yeah. Well, you know, Jesus, you know, had, Jesus, Jesus had one, famously. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah. Um, so but, I can understand, you know, what would Jesus do? I guess, you know, have some matzah is the answer. So if Jesus comes back to one of these people's Seders, is that make the Last Supper the next to last supper? <laughs> the penultimate the supper. The penultimate supper. I guess so. Um, so I want to put my money down. If I was going to pick a Jewish holiday that has the chance to break into the mainstream, my, my choice is for, uh, the one and only fun commemoration of our almost destruction, which is Purim. (laughs) 
usually happens early spring, so yeah. before Easter. Purim's good. Purim's it already good. has uh, delicious food associated with it, and nothing weird. Nothing like weird that only Jews find tasty, like a filter fish. Just straight up cookies with full of jam. You know, the hamantaschen is a great Jewish the snack. Hamantaschen is very good too. Uh, yeah. No one gets mad at that. No one gets mad at eating a hamantaschen. Some good. Uh, Chocolate ones, poppy seed ones, that kind of celebration. Yeah. It's got dressing up, you yeah. know. Uh, no one has to go in uh, blackface, but if Justin Trudeau wants to come to the Purim celebration, then I guess he can. Wow. That seems to be, be the way he, he dresses up for things. <laughs> but aside from that, it has yeah. fun costumes. That joke didn't go halfway. You went the whole McGillow on that one. That's right. Okay. I've got other, I've got other pitches for Purim. Okay. Go on. I got, uh, I got a couple, but let's hear, but there's a lot of stomping. There's a lot of stomping Good and noise making. Stomping, a lot of drinking. A lot of kids have fun with that. When I was in university amongst at least the Jewish community and many non-Jews on campus at McGill, Canadian university with big Jewish populations, McGill's got a reputation as somewhat of a party school, but I can promise you the craziest, the most lit, the, the wildest, the greatest excess party of every year was Chabad Purim. I don't think I ever went. There was, there's, you'd walk into the Chabad house, there's a band of guys with payas doing Led Zeppelin covers. You know, wow. people would be moshing and dancing, of course, with the screen down the middle and men on one side and men and women on the other side. Yeah. But there'd be a really great party. People would be just chain smoking cigarettes in the kitchen. There'd be kids handing out beers. Then you'd go upstairs and there was an entire room of candy. There would just be tables of it and a chocolate fountain and fruit to dip in it. Then you'd go up another floor and there'd be people smoking dope and doing a Megillah reading with lots of stomping and lots of clapping. And then you'd go down back down to the basement where there's hot food. Wow. There's like all kinds of barekas and, and dumplings and kishka and the whole just so much. And that's just the food and the booze. And there's all the people there and everyone's dressed up. It's a great time. I, I once brought a friend of mine uh, named Matthew Goodman, who is Chinese and Jewish. Sure. And he certainly visually pre presents as Chinese. And a rabbi saw him on Purim as we walked into the Chabad house and asked in Hebrew kind of a, what are you doing here? Uh, you know, are you Jewish? And Mr. Goodman, uh, through his, you know, uh, Drunken Hayes responded in Hebrew, and that rabbi almost plotzed. It was a great time. <laughs> That's great. So apparently, if you ever want to go party with, uh, you know, six Mordecais or whatever, the McGill Purim party is, is the way to place oh, to go. It was absolutely lit. So I, my holiday is also spring holiday. Okay, I'm going to suggest we do Tu Bishvat. Tu Bishvat, Jewish which, Jewish Arbor Day. Jewish Arbor Day, which coincides in Israel and should be. It changes every year. So because a Jewish calendar changes every year, I my suggestion of Tu Bishvat is that it could be in any country at any time. Okay. Because Tu Bishvat is the bloom of the trees. So we're always having Tu Bishvat you, somewhere? You are always having Tu Bishvat somewhere. So when your local trees are blooming, you know, if they're... You, people go absolutely ape for a uh, uh, Sakura bloom. Okay. Wherever they are in the world. People right. travel over the world to go to Japan. Sure. People in Toronto here, people go to High Park to look at the blooms. People go to Trinity Bellwoods Park to look at the apple blossom blooms. All of those days are your Tu Bishvat. So everyone is having their two own Tu Bishvats, and it's a Jewish holiday, a Jewish event that you could celebrate then. Okay. I don't know exactly what is associated with Tu Bishvat. I feel like eating certain fruits, like stone, like uh, dried fruits, I remember. There being is a, a thing. Seder of Tu Bishvat. But I think tree um, planting is, is the big thing. It is. You're yeah. supposed to, you're, you're absolutely planting trees, and you eat uh, dried fruit and almonds. Right. Fruit that come from trees. The Shkadia Iparachat. That's right. Um, so I think that's a good idea. I think Tu Bishvat could catch on as just like a general, you know, if, if the Jews are going to be associated with something, it could be tree planting. That's not yep. a terrible thing to be associated I think with. Absolutely. Um, especially and, in this day and age. And in, you know, on kibbutzim in Israel and on farms in Israel, they celebrate it as a uh, sort of general harvest celebration, right. an agricultural holiday. You know, your biodynamic farming, worshiping the, the god or witch. I think that's a good idea. I think those are some good options, and uh, we'll have to see if anybody runs with it. Absolutely. Cer certainly encourage somebody to uh, try and market a Jewish holiday. Whenever whenever you see a tree, say, say the Shrechianu. That's right. what we're trying to say on Tupi Shvat. Sure. Shall we get on with our interview? Yeah, we are lucky to be joined today by uh, Nate Thompson, currently of the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, Nate's had a long career in the NHL. A, uh, a respected vet, a glue guy, a locker room hero. Yeah, previously with the LA Kings uh, and in Los Angeles is where he met his wife, as he told us. And his wife is part of the reason why he converted to Judaism. That's right. He's from Anchorage, Alaska. 
from which I understand, not an American Jewish Mecca, although our producer Michael is quick to point out that there is a group of Jews who refer to themselves as the Frozen Chosen in Alaska. Right. Probably enough for a minion, uh, maybe not enough to start their own colony. Um, you know, no Yiddish policeman's union going on up there. Right. That's true. Even though it was, uh, as for our literary corner of this week, the Michael Chabon novel in which he suggests it strongly. Yeah. Uh, but Nate gives us a little uh, rundown on how he came to the faith and what his conversion process was like. Uh, as well as some of his favorite places to uh, get a chocolate chip cookie in Montreal. Yeah. So we'll leave it there and we'll go ahead to our interview with Nate Thompson. Hello, Mr. Thompson. Hello. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? Thanks for uh, chatting with us. No problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, I hear it's your birthday tomorrow. Tomorrow, correct. Oh, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Anything excited to plan, mate? Um, just play a hockey game. <laughs> yeah, big game tomorrow against the Leafs. Yeah, that's it. That's my only plan. Usually, oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, every year my birthday, I mean, around this time, is always usually a practice or a game, so it's usually how it goes. It's all right, though. Right. All right on. And I, I guess we owe you a uh, Happy New Year, Shinatova. Happy New Year, Shantova. Ah, yeah. oh, very nice. Um, well, thanks for joining us so much, Nate. Uh, you know, we're a podcast about Jews and sports and sort of tackling all those those issues, highlighting Jews, Jewish athletes, and uh, the way that Judaism has interacted with the game. Um, so I wonder if you could tell our listeners a little bit about how you came to Judaism as someone who uh, didn't grow up in, in the faith. Um, pretty much, uh, I mean, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, um, she's Jewish. And, uh, you know, when we started dating, you know, I was um, kind of immersed into, you know, her family. And, you know, I celebrated all the holidays. And, um, you know, really kind of saw how family-oriented everything is. And I was, you know, they were great how they included me in every holiday. And I think, um, you know, I growing up, you know, I was, you know, my mom's side of the family was Catholic and dad was Christian, but kind of, you know, never really was, um, you know, tied to one. And, uh, you know, as we started dating, I kind of mentioned to her, I was like, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, if we end up getting married or whatever, you know, really like to convert. And, you know, cause we talked about raising our kids, uh, Jewish. So I figured, you know, let's go all in here. So, uh, before, so it was your yeah, idea. It was my idea, yes. It was not my wife uh, telling me to do it. <laughs> are people surprised by that when you tell them? Uh, yes, they are, actually. Uh, they're very surprised. Even my, even my in-laws, too. You know, my, my mother-in-law is, <laughs> is uh, as you know, uh, Jewish mothers are very overbearing. But uh, she is, she's fantastic. I mean, they're both my, my in-laws are great. And they never, ever once said, mentioned me at all or pressured me into converting or, um, you know, a, 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 any sort of thing like that. So, you know, I was, uh, it was a very, it was a very, uh, awesome experience and, uh, we had a full Jewish wedding and, uh, it was great. So you got to step on the glass and the whole chairs and the thing, the whole thing, the whole thing. Yeah. We, uh, signed the Ketuba before and, uh, did it, did it all. Oh, that's I, amazing. I imagine your, uh, your hockey buddies had an easy time placing you in the chair. No, they loved it. It was it was actually a lot of fun. I mean, a, a lot of guys were uh, they were having a good time with that at the wedding. You know, everyone was wearing their kippahs, and um, you know, it, it's just pretty funny to see a bunch of hockey guys, uh, you know, in the in the crowd watching a wedding. You know, all wearing them, and uh, and then and oh, just great. loving it, and, and then loving it. You know, they were like after, you know, they were like, we we got to go to more Jewish weddings. It's the most fun <laughs> I ever had. So. Uh, it was, it was, it was an awesome experience. I find that as a Jewish person going to non-Jewish weddings, they're just way less exciting. Like, oh, another <laughs> wedding. Great. I totally agree. I mean, I, I, I always joke around. I said, my wedding is the nicest and most fun wedding I'll ever go to. Because, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to go up from, uh, from our wedding. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's well, awesome. Jewish, Jewish so. weddings, Jewish weddings almost always have an open bar. And I find that, uh, sometimes it's not always the case for non-Jewish weddings. Yeah, no, it was like, I, I want the one thing like with Jewish, you know, with Jewish people, there's food and everything else, Jewish, food is fun, like there's no shortage of that. And that's exactly what our 
our wedding was all about. It was uh, it was great. And uh, were you living in L.A. at the time? We were. So my wife is um, she's originally her and her family are from Beverly Hills, and mm-hmm. uh, that's that's where we got married. So what is? I mean, you've been moving around a bit since you've converted. Do you think anything's notable about? Jewish community in Los Angeles against the community in Montreal or anywhere else. Have you, what was that process like converting in one place and then going somewhere else? Um, it was great. I mean, as you know, I mean, I feel like as I've converted and, um, you know, like, like we talk about it's a tribe, you know, it's our own little community. And, um, I've learned uh, different places. There's always, a great Jewish community where the, whether when I was in Ottawa now in Montreal and, uh, it's it's awesome because I get a lot of support and um you know even for example you know you know for Rosh Hashanah I had so many messages on you know on social media from people you know wishing me a happy new year and just being so aware that uh that I'm Jewish now and I think um it's it's pretty uh it's pretty cool to see and see how aware everyone is of it and and definitely uh, being a Jewish athlete. That's great. Well, have you uh, have you had an opportunity to check out any of the sort of you know haunts of, of Jewish Montreal? There's some famous Schwartz is a very famous smoked meat place. Obviously, Montreal bagels are, are big. There's you know other bakeries and and uh, steakhouses and things like that. There, yeah, you know what? My wife she knows how to find a really good Jewish bakery, and she found. Uh, I can't remember the neighborhood there, but it was. Uh, but we we went to this one bakery, and it was probably the best chocolate chip cookie I've ever had. <laughs> and, was it uh, Was it Chesky's by any chance? Chesky's, Chesky's, that's yeah. it. Chesky's, yeah, that's, that's the famous that's place the in Montreal. It's great. Oh my gosh, that place is incredible. So we found a gem there, and um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know what my wife's. She usually wherever we go, she knows where to search them out, and uh, I just follow her lead. Oh yeah, I, I'll give you a tip. Uh, Schwartz's is good. Lester's is better. Lester's usually so less of a line. Lester's, so Lester's it's in that. So Lester's is better than Chesky's, is what you're saying? No, then Schwartz's. Sorry. Oh, Schwartz's. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, that's nothing's better than Chesky's. That's oh, good. that's so it. Chesky's is the mecca. Okay, perfect. Oh yeah, that's good to know. And the good to the know. cheese tarts are unbelievable. Yeah, we've only we've only got into the. You know the sweets and the pastries. Really, we haven't gotten the other stuff, but we're we're definitely uh, we're definitely be going back. Her parents are coming into town um, uh, next week uh, after Yom Kippur, so uh, we'll definitely make a trip over there with them. Oh, that's awesome! Uh, you mentioned something earlier about sort of fans coming out to you. How aware during this process uh, were you? Did you were you that you were about to make a whole lot of new fans? I had, honestly, I had no expectations, and I had no, I had no idea that I would, uh, I'd have this many people be reaching out to me about it. And it, it, it's like I said, you know, it's like a, it's, it's like a tribe, your own little uh, community tribe of people that, uh, you know, kind of look out for their own. And uh, it was just such a, I don't know, it was such a, it, it's been such a great experience, and and um, I don't know. I, I don't really don't know how else to describe it, but it's been it's just been really nice. I mean, there's so much support from everybody. I see that the Canadians have a have a game coming up on uh on Wednesday. Are you planning on playing on, on Yom Kippur? No no judgment obviously if you are. I mean lots of I will, athletes have. I will be playing, yes. Um uh, but I you know, it's just kind of the way it goes, like you said, no judgment, but uh gotta help my team out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, we we believe that Jewish athletes tend to play really good on Jewish holidays. I don't know I mean, if that's, that's true, but I, I mean, believe it. I've, I mean, you guys are putting it out there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run with that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right on. And have you, have you reached out or spoken to any any of the other Jewish players in the NHL? I mean, there's Zach Hyman on the Leafs. You'll be seeing tomorrow. Um, the Hughes brothers. There. I mean, they just joined this year. I, I haven't actually. I mean, I. I try and see who I think, um, you know, who is Jewish and in, uh, in the league, but I haven't actually had a time. I haven't actually had a chance to, like, to interact with any of them. But if I do get a chance, maybe I'll, you know, I'll mention something. Maybe tomorrow I'll, uh, I'll say Happy New Year and see what he says. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, if you uh, if you and and Hyman go at it uh, tomorrow, that'll be you know big news for a big deal for the Canadian Jewish news. That's really in our wheelhouse there. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Before you go, we wanted to ask you: Are there any Jewish athletes you think about or you've loved in the past? Who who to you is on your Mount Rushmore of Jewish pro athletes? Oh, I'm trying to think of some uh, Mount Rushmore of athletes. I don't know. It's if you, start, if you give me a few right now off the top, of, yeah, well, Sandy Koufax is a big one, and probably uh, Sandy Koufax, uh, yeah, you know, that's, that's a big, big guy for LA, where you where yeah. you converted. Yeah, Sandy Koufax. Uh, you know what's actually funny? That's my my father-in-law's. He he he's a huge Dodger fan, and he loves right. uh, he loves Sandy Koufax. So I, I mean, that's definitely I'll I'll often say that one just for my father-in-law, probably. Oh, right on. What did you do on Rosh Hashanah? Is this for like I know you're in the middle of training camp, but were you, you were able to find a time to have any family time or uh, or anything like that? Yeah, my wife and I were. Uh, my wife actually made it to. Uh, she made a temple. I, like I said, I did not. It was. Uh, it was just been a tough time to training camp and game schedule and stuff. But uh, oh yeah, we're not judging. Don't worry. Yeah, no, I didn't go sense. either. No, no, right, <laughs> uh, but you know she. I told her just go for me, please, and she did. So uh, it, it worked out, and uh, we're definitely uh, we're definitely going to be going to temple together, though, when uh, when I have some off days and when I can go for sure. Oh, that's great. Well, uh, thanks again for for joining. I think that's probably about all the the time we have. Uh, thanks for giving us your time, though. Shabbat shalom, and uh, good luck tomorrow against the Leafs. Uh, give them hell. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for having me. Right on. We'll be watching. Thanks so much. All right, boy. All right, guys. Yeah. Happy New Year. Thanks again to Nate Thompson for joining us. Uh, he is a really funny guy yeah. and uh, seems to really enjoy the faith. Talks, ha- gives a wicked Shana Tova. Yeah. And uh, now if you hear uh, Hava Nagila being played at the uh, Bell Center, it might have a little double meaning. That's right. I hope he's just sort of whoring by himself on the uh, bench. I, uh, I liked what he had to say about Jewish weddings. I know been to Jew- non-Jewish people, when they come to weddings, really get really excited about Jewish weddings, and it was amazing he got to experience that for himself. Uh, we'll leave it there for now. Uh, as always, uh, please like and subscribe to our podcast. Uh, if you have any feedback, we'd love to get it. Uh, you can follow us, at all- as always, at uh, Menschwarmers on Twitter. Uh, if I am up late and in the mood, you might hear me. Uh, you might see me tweeting about the Jewish goings-on in the Major League Baseball playoffs. I don't know if we need to our listeners want to know what's late what's going on if you're up late and in the mood my friend check the twitter feed that's that's where you find it yikes uh you can follow us on facebook at uh, the cjn podcast network and find us as always at cjnews.com that's right and uh, wherever you get your podcasts we'd like to thank michael Freeman for guest producing this episode our supervising producer of the cjn podcast network alex rose is off tonight uh we would also like to thank jamie ross for the tip on mr thompson setting up that interview and the story Um, as well, uh, the hard work by all of the people at the CJ News each week. And the uh, Canadians communication staff for helping us set up the interview. And uh, again, thanks to Nate Thompson. Yeah. Until next time, have an easy fast. And Shana Tova.